I'm joined here with uh, by uh, Shane Sassania, who's co-founder and CEO of Gravity Sketch, and then also uh, Lucas Van Dorp, uh, who is uh, an industrial designer at Kinney's Design uh, in, in Belgium. Um, there's, there's a couple of other panelists that, I've, uh, that, that, that we've got on here that are for, from our team that um, I'm just gonna uh, unmute their, their video, um, or mute their video right now, um, but they will be doing, helping out with a demonstration uh, later of co-creation. But in terms of what we're, what we're gonna go through today, um, we're uh, basically gonna, gonna give a bit of an introduction to Gravity Sketch. Uh, I know some of you that are on this call are you know, very seasoned users at this, um, but some of you, that, that, you know, maybe the first time that you're, you're hearing about Gravity Sketch or, or, or a lot of details. So we'll give you a brief introduction about that. Bit of an introduction on co-creation um, that we've been, we've been developing and, and very excited to share with everyone uh, today. I'm going to then talk to Lucas, who uh, him and his team have been, have been using Gravity, uh, Gravity Sketch co-creation as, as one of our alpha testers over the last few months. And, and um, it'd be really great to, to you know, share with you all some of the experiences that, that Lucas has had. And then we'll give you a, a, bit, a bit of a, a demo. And you know, live demos always come with some kind of risk with TechWise, but we are we are going to uh, give, give it our best shot, and we can you know, test it this. Uh, so, um, but but uh, yeah, that's that's the plan. Um, just very briefly in terms of quick housekeeping um, for for you all, there is um, there is a, a, a Q and A and also a chat functionality built into this. So if you would like to ask any questions, feel free to drop them either into the, into the chat or into the Q&A, or you can also raise your hand on the, on the participant list and I will be, I'll be keeping an eye, eye on that as well. And then we can you know, unmute you to ask your question and so on as well, if, that, if, that, if that's best. And at the end of this, we will have a, a, a Q&A session for you, so there'll be plenty of time to, to answer, answer any questions you have. Um, so I will stop talking uh, now and, uh, and move on to the, the meat of this. So um, first of all, um, Shay, it would be really good if you could um, if you could just give a brief introduction for those who are less familiar with, with Gravity Sketch on on what it is, and then um, you know also you know, the story of why we have developed uh, co-creation now. Yeah, absolutely. So, Gravity Sketch is a three D design platform. It's allowing anyone to jump into immersive reality, virtual reality, and start creating seamlessly. So, as if you were sketching on pen and paper, we always feel like this gestural language is missing from some of the 3D tools, well, most of the 3D tools. And it's, it's primarily because you're locked behind uh, a keyboard and mouse and a 2D display. So you're, you're kind of always working off of a plane when in, in reality, a lot of the things that we're designing have complex curves. And the, the genesis of the, of the company was really around how can engineers and designers have like just a more streamlined communication both engineers and designers speak the same exact language, the language of 3D. In fact, like all humans speak 3D, right? But we use different vernacular or, you know, slightly different, um, yeah, just a slightly different version of that language when we want to represent our ideas. And the most immediate way to represent your ideas is in 2D. So an engineer will do amazing plan views, top, front, side, even a really nice orthographic view. And it will convey dimensionality at 120 or you know 100 scale, almost to the T. And an industrial designer will do a very beautifully well-crafted emotional sketch, which will tell a lot of the character of the, of the product and essentially the, the emotion that they're trying to invoke. And so when it comes to mirroring these two things together, you end up with a lot of miscommunication. And there actually starts to become this um, I guess like poor work environment is what I could call it. My, my background is in, in manufacturing and design. And, and I always saw this kind of rift between engineering and designing. And I felt that it was a bit of a shame because if people were working a bit more tightly together, not only would you have a better product, but you'd be working more efficiently and have a happier working environment and, and working space. So by in, introducing this three-dimensional sketching tool and then bringing it forward into collaboration, the idea is that you're kind of like problem solving in the 3D space together. And that's what industrial design is. And that's what engineering is. It's really a problem solving ex exercise. And Gravity Sketch was initially just a sketching tool. So we literally only had a sketch as the first tool. It's just like your ink stroke. And when we started bringing in mathematicians to start working on the code, we, we realized that we can do so much more with NURBS. We can start doing surfaces, we can do revolves, and then eventually we can convert NURBS to sub D. And so it became this really great uh, creation tool. 
but we, we still haven't lost sight of the ethos, which is to create better communication bridge between design and engineering and just a better way of conveying your ideas. So even with the concept art community jumping involved, you know, I guess that, that kind of translates slightly different than industrial design. It's more about conveying your concept art to maybe a very precise 3D model who has to make it optimized for a game engine. So there's that kind of communication bridge is still, it still transcends beyond just the industrial design um, workflow. So it's a bit of a long-winded answer, but I think it's really important to give context to what it is that we're building and why. Um, one thing I'll just say as a final thing is we're not looking to replace any of your CAD tools or rendering tools or any of your 2D pipeline tools. We're looking to enhance that communication layer that is really missing or is only brought to life when you have a plain model or a physical foam model or a 3D print. So hopefully we can get you faster to those, those um, discussions in, in, in virtual reality. And maybe you're doing fewer prints or fewer clay models and you're doing more real life um, or in, in real time 3D conversations. Great. And then um, in terms of the, the co-creation feature that we're, uh, that we're here to talk about today, um, would you be able to give a bit of a, a brief background as to um, you know, how that came about originally and, and why it is that we've, we've developed it to, to the state that, uh, that it's in today? Yeah, I have to give a lot of credit to our head of engineering, actually, um, and our CTO, because initially we, we were just thinking to build a really great, robust tool for communicating ideas. And it would be very easy for you just to send that file from Gravity Sketch into um, CAD via FBX, OBJ, IGIS, and that was the communication layer that we were kind of like thinking as the apex. And we hired Kay, our head of engineering, and he has this really great background in game, game design, game development for, for MMO games. And he had this really grand vision about how we can build an infrastructure that will allow like, just like a, a real gameplay, multiple people at the same time to be in, in the space. And our CTO was also, uh, has a background in gaming and is very passionate about how this, this social element could actually enhance the communication layer. And we kind of knew this obviously from being working at, I worked at Jaguar Land Rover and a few other companies. So we knew when you get around a 3D model or 3D property, it's very easy to have like such a great social experience where you're talking about the real problem on hand and marking up. But we just, I guess we didn't quite understand the, the technical layer to it. And so over the past few years, we've been experimenting with with how we can do this in a closed network environment with very you know, specific IT setups. And we did this with, with our partner Ford. And within the first month, we saw like amazing efficiencies in the way that they worked and just a different dynamic in how they held design reviews where they were bringing people in at a design review where it's just like a wireframe. It wasn't, you know, there's no beautiful like markups in Photoshop or none of that work. It was just, here's the rough portions for volumes. Here's an imported CAD model. And so they were able to also bring a wide variety of, of disciplines into that design review, which completely changed the game. It was essentially having a design review with designers, engineers, and marketing people, color and material, color and trim, that type of engagement. So the social element uh, was, was something that we were really happy to chase after. And, and we just happened to have the right technical chops and the team to, to execute on this and also be passionate about executing on this. I, I can't, can't stress that enough that these guys are really passionate about making this a, a social collaborative type of experience. And, and so we're kind of getting back to our genesis as Gravity Sketch, where we're breaking down that communication layer between um, designers and, and engineers and designers and designers and designers and marketing teams, designers and clients. Um, it's, it's really just the, I think it's the, the most, I guess it's the most, the, uh, trying to think of a great word here, but it's probably the, it's the best way that we can serve our customers and we can serve this industry is by focusing in on the, this, this aspect of, of the design process as opposed to just making great, great design tools. I think it's, it's, it's more than that. It's about how you communicate. And that's, that's what a sketch is in the end of the day. Great, thank you. And um, I don't know how many of the, the attendees are aware that last week we launched a pretty big, a pretty big update to the product um, so Shay, it would be really helpful, I think, if you could give a, a sort of a brief overview of what's in what's in there and um, and, and what that means, um, I guess, in terms of co-creation specifically as well. Sure. Yeah. So I'll definitely plug the update. <clears throat> Pretty big update went out. We added a ton of workflow features, mainly around um, getting the most out of the nerds geometry that you're creating, as well as 
uh, being able to jump into like one-to-one -one scale much faster through a, a, just a button gesture. Um, most of these things you can find online. But we did a huge revamp of Landing Pad, which is our cloud platform. You can store your files, you can view your files, you can take screenshots. It's almost like bringing something quickly out of VR and having it in the browser. But through that and through that signing up of Landing Pad, our, our cloud platform, you're also able to facilitate collaboration. And so we're running a beta of this with studios uh, like Achilles, which you'll hear from Lucas, where they're still you know, in the height of this remote working and the pandemic, they're, they're still able to service their customers and clients. And so we did put a lot of work over the past three months into that. We kind of accelerated that development from something that was just a prototype that we were working on with Ford quite, quite, quite heavy to now a full blown product. And we're trying to roll it out as a small, um, in small batches. So we're encouraging people to come sign up, share their use case with us and, and why they'd like to do that, like to explore this. And before we, we actually launch it to the, to the masses and the rationale for this is just so we can actually test the technology because, you know, if we, if we were to throw like hundreds of people at once onto the server, uh, it doesn't give us enough, I guess, enough bandwidth to, to give that type of support and onboarding experience that we'd like to, to do with, uh, with a smaller groups, a smaller cohort. So there's a lot of learning to be done here, but it's a, it's a massive update for us where now anyone can get access to this feature and we'll start with the design studios and, and move, move forward from there. Is there anything I'm missing out on this, on this update, Rich? No, I think that's, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think that's all. And, and, you know, if anyone wants to sort of, you know, further details on that, you can find it on our, on our blog, on our website, there's, there's sort of all the details of, of all the, all the different features that have been added, um, which is basically the culmination of about six months worth of, uh, of of development um so yeah for, for those that have tried it i hope you're enjoying it and do do please continue to to give us feedback um i'm gonna now bring bring lucas in into this so lucas um you you've been you've been using co-creation at, at, at achilles um for, for a few months now but i think you know for everyone it'd be really helpful if you could just give a, a bit of a, a brief background into yourself and achilles and then we'll um We'll talk about how you how you've used it and, and what the impact has been. All right, absolutely. Um, so my name is Lucas. Hi, um, I used to be a product designer student at the University of Antwerp, and I work at Achilles. Now Achilles is a um, product and service and branding design company uh, from Belgium. We have about thirty five people working. Uh, some of those focus on um, hardcore product design, actual materials and shapes. Others are more focused towards serving customers, interaction. Uh, some are designing services. So I think what, um, what signifies Achilles is, is a company that has innovation as its, at its core, um, but has so many different aspects of how we implement that, whether it be through services or styling or, um, or, or branding. So we don't just do the styling of products. I think that's, that's uh, what makes Achilles, I think, and uh, very interesting and also Gravity Sketch, how Gravity Sketch fits into that. Um, because Gravity Sketch is great for styling. I mean, go on Instagram and search for Gravity Sketch, you see the most beautiful sketches. But it can also be used for communicating more complex ideas, systemic ideas, um, architecture type, not just architecture as in how does a building look, but how will it, will it be used? How, uh, how will it function? Um, so I haven't been with Achilles for too long. I'm only 24 years old, um, but I've been working uh, with Gravity Sketch uh, with my thesis and uh, at Achilles also a lot on a lot of different projects. Uh, and we're currently expanding that in, inside Achilles and getting all our designers on board, getting them used to the tools and starting to offer it to our clients as well. Lucas, can you tell us like a little bit about how you got into design in general and then like where, where did this kind of, where did your discovery of this type of technology actually intersect with that? Yeah, I think it's an interesting story actually. Um, so as a kid, I mean, six years old, 10 years old, uh, I used to play a lot with Legos. I was always interested in, in building stuff. Uh, one of my favorite computer games was um, Roller Coaster Tycoon, where you made your own park. And I love to just make, make the most beautiful um, buildings by putting together rocks and walls and that was my first experience with, with 3D modeling in fact um, but then I got through through um, secondary education and I went to design 
uh, design school university and in the first year we work a lot with uh, foam models so that's a block of foam where we carve our shapes out of and that's a lot of work uh, it's very frustrating these these foam blocks are really hard to work with and i got really frustrated and then came along uh, in my case solarworks a typical cat package which solves all my problems and i was so happy to learn 3d modeling because you can do so much on a pc but then after a while we started doing surface modeling more complex geometry and then i was frustrated yet again because if you've ever tried um, accurate surface modeling you probably know what i mean when i say it's it's, it's hard to just come up with a concept and make a few sketches in 3D. The tools aren't made for that. Uh, so that's when I started Blender, uh, which is a lot more freeform. It's not as accurate, but it's a lot more freeform. It allows you to do beautiful renders and really quick concepts. So I fell in love with Blender, started a YouTube channel on that. Um, and then just a few years later, later uh, Gravity Sketch came along. And while I was focused on the hard software all the time, Gravity Sketch it just made so much sense. The first time I tried it, it just, you draw a line in space and immediately, immediately you understand the value. Uh, you don't have to go, you, you don't have to learn much of, of uh, an interface. It, it's a really simple interface there is. Um, but it just makes, yeah, it made so much sense to draw in that way. And then any time from that, um, almost any time from that, when I needed to do any kind of styling or wanted to, shows a certain configuration of a product or how something would be used or I needed some visuals of, of a product in, con in, in context, I would just head straight to Gravity Sketch. Um, yeah, because it makes so much sense, it's such a, a fast tool to work with. Mm -hmm. So of course I use all those tools now. I use foam models, I use CAD uh, and I use Gravity Sketch. But Gravity Sketch is one of my favorites ones because it's, it makes sense. It's, I think less of a cognitive load because you have to think less about the software itself and about the interface and you can more think about what you're designing and communicating. And I'm, I've become quite experienced now, uh, I, I can say that, uh, to the point where I can almost meet someone in co-creation, draw up concepts as I'm talking about them, which was something that you can't dream of with any other software tool. A pen, and, a pen on paper can do a lot, but it can't do the, the whole immersiveness, the whole uh, being inside of a room uh, scale wise. You touch on something here that I hear a lot when we, we've been speaking to quite a few industrial design studios over the past few months. You talked about sketching with the client. Is, is that yeah. like a very common thing that is practiced in, in your studio? And, and can, how has that process helped the client understand what, I guess, what you're trying to convey? Like, is that real time sketching or how, how, how do you conduct I think when, when we bring clients in, we do, make, we do our best to present a nice space with clear concepts, clearly labeled, so that they are, enter a space which is organized and understandable. Because oftentimes clients don't have any experiences via, in VR, so the, the whole putting on a headset and being inside a virtual space is already quite a, uh, a load for them to process. Um, so we, we try to present our sketches as neatly as possible uh, and then guide them through. Uh, and then we can make annotations and grab project, uh, products and, and move them around and show them how things work. But we don't go sketching directly with the clients except for annotations. Mm -hmm. uh, internally with uh, the people that are used to the tool, we just go all out uh, mm -hmm. sketching. And were you doing like 2D sketching with clients before you guys got into 3D in the beginning? Like was that just a common practice that would have happened at your studio? Like just a pen and paper? Um, well, like I said a couple of minutes ago, I can't really talk about my workflow because every project is so different. Sure. Um, but it depends on the idea that we want to communicate. If it's just a really simple idea, as in if, what if we put those components in that configuration, we often just make a sketch on paper. Um, but if you want to show, for example, how a product will look, uh, how, how it will be styled, what kind of feel it has, we either use 2D sketching because that allows us to uh, allows a lot of freedom and a lot of emotion. Like I was said earlier, car design is often a really emotionally driven type of, of styling. Um, or we went to CAD tools. Yeah. Um, but those, like I said, those aren't really suitable for those first, first steps in the design process. You don't want to spend hours and hours and hours just making a shape and spending so much time because it's an organic shape. So mm -hmm. that's where Gravity Sketch comes in, I think. And um, being able to have very present uh, complete concepts, complete styling or a product inside of a context uh, and be able to present that 
that's something that we can't do with, with CAT and with PEPA. Yeah. And can we just backtrack a little bit to the design process? Because it's it's actually quite rare to find a industrial designer as this being a, a normal part of their tool 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 chain, like having a virtual reality. I think it's still like the industrial designers are on the iPad Pro or walking tablet. And yeah. Quite a leap to take to jump into VR. So yeah, yeah. What what kind of encouraged you to do that? And what do you think is maybe a blocker for some of the I guess maybe more think, seasoned industrial designers from moving into the space? I think that there's two main factors that contribute to that. One is that I'm new to Oculus. I just came from from school, uh, and I'm really enthusiastic about the tool. I've been using it. I've been able to show what you can do with it, and um, Oculus is very receptive of that. They allow uh, all designers to be creative in their own way. They allow them to yeah to really blossom in their in their own expertise um, but then secondly Achilles also has a spin-off called aeroplane um, which has been making virtual reality experiences for uh, quite a few years for external clients but also for our designers so our designers at Achilles know what VR can um, can offer for a design process or for the client and aeroplane has made that possible um, up to now, and they continue to do that. They make really high quality uh, interactive experiences, something that Gravity Sketch doesn't do. Um, but now with Gravity Sketch coming up and us designers using it as a sketching tool, that connection get, gets even even stronger be, be, um, between high quality virtual, react, uh, virtual reality experiences and uh, design practice. Mm -hmm. so, so those two factors are, are what caused Achilles to jump into VR that fast. And and how about the customer, the client side? Like maybe like whether it's Gravity Sketch or not, on the client side, how do you guys essentially bring them into the virtual reality environment, get them to feel comfortable and acclimated to to working in VR? Because this is still a big thing that we see in a lot of our other clients. Like it's a big challenge to get their their clients or their customers into virtual reality. Absolutely, uh, and that's that's largely a hardware thing. Um, headsets are still things that you have to strap on, and they're not very comfortable sorry comfortable um and the displays and controllers getting to know everything that's that's still a bit of an issue uh, but i do believe that it's the same situation as we had uh, let's say 50 years ago when computers were first introduced people didn't know how to use them they didn't know uh, what to expect from them and there was a lot of talk about how does a computer work and what's the hardware like and how do you get set up uh, and right now everyone knows how to use a computer it's, it's such a it's such a ubiquitous tool. Uh, and I think that's the same with, with uh, virtual reality. Right now we're talking about the headsets, we're talking about resolution and software and, and um, about the hardware itself. But I think maybe in, in just five or 10 years, we'll just, we'll just be talking about the benefits that it has for us. And we'll be using it, I believe, as, as a ubiquitous tool as well. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I, given that you are pretty young in the, in the organization, do you, have you seen like what the benefit of going using VR for a workflow or for a presentation, a client meeting, like what kind of savings, time savings, cost savings, like, like where do you see that being? Is it like miles ahead of just using the traditional 2D tools or is it something that's just like marginally better, helps sell the project a little bit better? Like, you know, where on the spectrum does that sit? Um, I think we're, we're, it's not a, um, it's a bit of a difficult question, again, because we have so many different workflows. Um, but we use a lot of different tools. We use CAD tools, we use 2D sketching, um, we use prototyping, as in we build cardboard models or we 3D print uh, objects. Or sometimes we build really big installations. Uh, and I think Gravity Sketch is a fast and easy tool that allows us to do many of the things that those tools offer. It allows us the speed of paper sketching, it allows us the a possibility to make really beautiful renders of a model once you've, you've made it in Gravity Sketch. Um, for presentation, you can do communication for which we would have uh, a 2D workflow with uh, animators maybe or uh, making beautiful sketches in Illustrator. Uh, and prototyping, especially when, when it comes to larger projects, sometimes we design um, like smart furniture. It's, it's Making a smart furniture prototype is not that easy when you're in a limited space office. So Gravity Sketch comes into so many different aspects of a design, sketching, CAD, prototyping. 
Um, and being able to work faster is, is uh, the main benefit for us because speed is, is, is what we are paid for. A designer is often paid by the hour, that's how we work. Um, so everything that gets us to work faster, while in this case even improving the quality of what we can bring, uh, is, is just good news for us and for our clients, of course. That's good. I want to touch on, and before we get into, I guess, some deeper questions and then the demo, I want to touch on accuracy. This has been a huge thing that has come up in our community around like, how do I get accuracy? And it's mainly coming from folks who haven't spent much time with the tool. So, and I understand from the outside looking in, this accuracy question is a big, a big question. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think what we're trained is to think of accuracy in millimeters, but I'm not sure if that actually holds water after you start using, you know, immersive tools and, and you're working at scale. But I'd like to hear your take on this accuracy question and, and working in immersive tools with, with accurate, accurate dimensionality or, or whatever it may, may when we're mean. Talking, when we're talking about accuracy uh, in, in the sense of dimensional accuracy or tolerances, um, I immediately think about manufacturing. Maybe uh, some bolts have to go through some holes or some axles need to be aligned. Um, but those are all questions regarding manufacture, manufacturability. Um, and I think gravity sketch plays a role much earlier, uh, mostly much earlier in the design process when we talk about what products are we going to make, what will its functions be, how will people use it, um, what will it look like, what will it evoke as an emotion, uh, in what context will it be placed. Those are a lot of big questions, and those are the questions that are uh, that define a, pro a product. Uh, if I think about an iPhone, they don't speak about how big in millimeters their holes are or the display dimensions exactly. You can find those online, but that's not what the iPhone is about. It's about a good design, about helping people. Um, so if you go into Gravity Sketch looking for accuracy, then you're going to be, I think, disappointed. There's no accurate millimeters. You can't make parts that fit together perfectly. Um, you're not going to find that there, just as you won't... Uh, well, you could draw accurately on paper. Of course, we used to do that with uh, like these big sketching tables with those rulers on top. You can do accurate drawing, but no one does that anywhere, anymore. And that's for a good reason. Well, some people do in architecture, folk, but we don't do that anymore. And that's for a good reason. We've got other tools for that. In the same way that gravity sketches for communication and prototyping. And when I need to design something accurately, when I need to make an assembly of parts that move together, I'll step towards other tools. I'll maybe sketch out a, a quick concept in Gravity Sketch, and then I'll move that over to CAD and find my accuracy there. And what file format are you using to bring over? So from Gravity Sketch, you're, what are you exporting as, and what are you picking it up as in the next software? Uh, well, there's main, two main categories, I'd say. One is mesh-based, uh, and that's OBJs, FBX, STL, those kinds, which are basically interchangeable, I think. Uh, and there's NURBS type geometry. And NURBS type geometry is more compatible with CAD. Um, but personally, I haven't been uh, exporting NURBS and, and editing the NURBS directly in CAD because SOLIDWORKS, the tool that I'm used to, is, just isn't compatible with that. Mm. Um, so we use meshes, we import those, and then we, have a, we put those on a transparent layer and then modeling accurately, start modeling accurately on top of that. So it's kind of like a tracing paper, like you just underlay it and then... Yeah. Got just it. in three day dimensions. Or we make 2D renders. That could also be a thing. Orthogonal renders of our sketch fab, uh, sketch up, gravity sketch model. Um, I use that. It just depends on how complex the, uh, the sketch is. Cool. So we're going to move into the demonstration now. And um, it would be good to continue our conversation. And what I'd like to do is almost like talk a little bit about how your team, obviously, during lockdown, has been able to move into using remote collaboration tools both the 2D tools and the 3D tools, including, including Gravity Sketch's co-creation uh, co work. So we'll have um, Emil, who's um, one, of our, uh, uh, one of our colleagues here, primarily focused on like, education efforts here at Gravity Sketch, making sure that everyone understands how to use the tool and, and where it could be applied. He'll, he'll jump in with Dunel, um, one of our, another one of our, uh, one of our colleagues here at Gravity Sketch, and I believe Sergi as well, um, another designer here at Gravity Sketch. And so they'll walk us through the process and it'd be great to just kind of talk through while we're watching what they're doing, but maybe even share a little bit about how you guys have adopted this type of tool and, and other ways that you're trying to solve some of the remote collaboration issues that 
are now posing themselves now that you guys can't go into the into the studio. Maybe we could put Emil's display. Yeah, I'll put. Yeah, we've got so we've got Emil and, and Sergi um, are, are going to be streaming their 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 screens. Um, I'm going to put put Sergi um, Sergi up. So what what Sergi is doing? Sergi is using. There's an external camera mode in. Uh, in, in Gravity Sketch, so so uh, Sergi is basically going to be operating the camera, and then Emil is is going to be over there and, uh, and, and creating uh, some sketch work. All right, wonderful. We might want to switch to Emil's camera. See that camera has a slightly better resolution, Rich. So yeah, it'd be great to just kind of talk through through your experience. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk uh, about a story of a uh, a meeting that was going on. A, I think about a month ago. Um, we have a project running. I can't talk too much about it because there's really strong uh, IP rights on that. Um, but it's for a major uh, client in the financial industry, um, and we're designing some sort of small furniture for them. That's about all I can say about it. Um, but it's a project that I wasn't involved in. I don't know what they're, exact, what they're doing exactly. I wasn't involved in the design. Um, but they had a meeting. I was at home, and they had a physical meeting in the office. They needed to discuss some prototypes. Um, and they were, um, one of my colleagues had made some sketches in Gravity Sketch. Uh, he's had, he hasn't had too much experience. Uh, but yet he, he managed to have an office building with his designs inside and it, it looked really, really, really nice. Um, but they had some issues getting things started up and, and uh, guiding their clients around the space with the teleporting and you know, they, did, they did no gravity sketch. So my colleague called me up he said, hey, could you just uh, join us, please? And so I did put on the headset and just in a couple of minutes, I was able to join them in VR and I could uh, see those clients. And I could guide them around, show them how to use the teleporting tool. Uh, then he was standing next to a part of a piece of furniture and he asked me about the scale. It's difficult to judge the scale of this thing. How big is it? So I brought in some mannequins, a tall guy, a large guy, put those mannequins on. And that communicates like how, how big is that? Uh, there were also some privacy concerns with some privacy shields uh, in some spaces. And um, being in virtual reality meant that you could actually get a feel for that furniture and feel, yeah, feel the scale, feel what you could see, what you could not see, how you could interact with the product. Um, now, don't get me wrong, these people, those clients, uh, they knew what VR was. They had experienced high quality VR, uh, experiences made in Unreal, Unity with lighting, materials, everything beautiful. Uh, and they went into Gravity Sketch, which doesn't have the fancy graphics. Uh, it's, it's more of a simple, um, a simple visual style, um, but I was there to help them. And that was something that they had never experienced before. Um, for them, um, VR was always a bit of an awkward solo experience. They got to put on a headset while 10 people behind them are watching, and you would awkwardly look around while people looked at the display and pointed things out, look at that, look at that. Um, and it was always this, this awkward experience for them. While in VR, we were both in the headset, we were, bo we were both equal. And it just, yeah, like I said before, it made so much sense to, to join him in, in VR. And I think that was one of the most, the experiences um, that I've had, that they've had, that really signifies that, yeah, this gravity sketch thing, that's, and this co-creation thing, it made so much sense to, to use this. Yeah, so... The collaboration and co-creation are kind of two words that we're, we're kind of mashing together quite a bit. <laughs> there are a few emerging companies who are starting to do collaboration where you can join in the same scene and have a discussion. What do you think the co-creation aspect of that is? So as, a, as the viewers can see here, it's the full Gravity Sketch design suite is in real time with your other colleagues. What does that actually bring to the table versus just being able to see people and, and talk to them in VR? In, in my experiences, this, uh, this is a trend that, that's happening. Uh, if we look at Adobe, they are doing this as well. 
for example, video editing used to be a one person job, but now multiple people can edit the same project. Um, and this is kind of like that. It, um, every user in the space gets the same tool set. They can all uh, edit everything at the same time and they can communicate at the same time, which is very cru crucial. Uh, something Adobe, in my opinion, doesn't have figured out all the way. Um, but it's a trend that's going on for, I think, a really good reason. Um, now, we've, we've uh, used co-creation um, for, for designing together, but mostly as uh, exploration, because not all our, our designers are experts at Gravity Sketch uh, yet, so they're still learning the tools. Um, so as we were sketching things out, I explained to them how tools uh, work, how you perform certain gestures, how you can build a piece of geometry in a couple of different ways. For example, here we're extruding. It's one way of doing it, but there's other tools that you can use to make the same kinds of geometry. Um, so we haven't designed actual products uh, that we, for, for a particular project yet, um, because we, need, we first need to yeah, get to know the tool better but undoubtedly we, we will in the future. And, and what do you think is driving this? Like <clears throat> what's driving that desire to learn? Is it, is it this, the speed or is it the collaboration aspect? What, what aspect is, is driving um, the team to like, dedicate time and commit to, to using this? I think one large driver behind that is the same driver that I had coming into Gravity Sketch, coming into Blender and, and Gravity Sketch is a frustration that we have with the tools that we're used to. Um, a lot of our designers know how to use CAD programs really well. They can make beautifully accurate 3D models, but ask them to, to just make a couple of variants or styling variants and they'll just get a headache um, thinking about the software again, thinking about the possibilities of the tool. Um, and some of our designers know how to sketch on paper, but they don't know how to 3D model. Mm -hmm. And I think seeing this tool and seeing how rapidly you can sketch and get something that is uh, that has the benefits of 3D and 2D combined. Um, it, it, yeah, it, it makes sense, and, and it seems like a. I think it is a solution to a lot of the frustration that we designers have with the tools that we use. And the key frustration is, like, what's the thing that's the thing that drives you up the wall the most? I think the fact that you have an idea in your head but you need the most direct path to get that out of your head and onto whatever it is, paper, a 2D display of virtual reality. Uh, we, we are, as a designer, you're trained to come up with a lot of ideas really quickly, quick designing, um, and you want to get that idea as, quick as quickly as possible visualized. And I think that's the main thing. And going to 2D sketching and starting a whole construction for having correct perspective or starting up your CAD program and doing all the technical stuff, both uh, get in the way of doing things quickly and effectively. So you could say it's, it's speed mainly, the speed of getting ideas that are in your, inside your head into a quite beautiful um, presentation worthy medium. And presumably these ideas don't have to be like manufacturable, feasible, man, manufacturable or like feasible by any means, right? No, absolutely. A lot of the work that we do is, is, doesn't have to do anything with manufacturability. Manufacturing is something you do at the end of it. Well, not at the end, but it's one of the later stages of a design process. But the actual, um, the interesting part, I could say, of product design is at the front, the front end. Yeah, this is this is like exactly where we wanted to position the tool as well. There's there's a few like things that are just happening now in the co-creation session. You can see that the guys are using annotations and notes and, and comments, and this is something that we're starting to explore a bit more deeply. What, what's your take on on this the annotations and maybe a couple of things that we 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 should probably look into expanding upon in this tool to make it a bit more powerful for designer to designer collaboration, designer to engineer collaboration, and then inevitably designer to, to client collaboration. I think um, I've, I've been uh, experimenting a lot with making um, beautiful sketches, sketches that you can show and that are uh, nice to look at, aesthetically pleasing, which is for me is very important. Uh, and I think annotations sometimes get in the way of that. So I often put them on transparent layers or make them very flat shaded. 
Um, but while talking about that, I think for annotation wise, I would think we should move forward. You should move forward <laughs> towards um, the type of annotation that's uh, used in, for example, Word documents or PowerPoint documents, where an annotation is a separate type of um, object. You can turn them on, you can turn them off, you can resolve them rather than having them as 3D entities in space like they are here. Because having those 3D entities sometimes gets a bit, a bit crowded. Uh, VR, even though the, the environment is empty right now, the annotations make things a bit crowded sometimes. There's way to get, uh, ways to get around it, like I said, having separate layers, making the annotations on muted colors. Um, but it, it is one of the core functionalities, so it does need to be there. Yeah, definitely. And you can see here that we have like three guys in the scene working on three different versions of the same, the same, um, I guess, idea or concept or theme. And I think that this is like something that I've seen, well, I know this is something I've seen in many studios where you'll often work on like a plethora of different 3D prints or foam models, or even in automotive, they'll, they'll sometimes do 50-50 on a claim model so you can work on different iterations and versions. Oh. But here, I guess you can just go into infinity. So how do you actually, how do you actually like limit that? You know, you, there's so many opportunity or options here. How do you kind of become a little bit more limited, a bit more precise? Because I think one thing that could be very daunting is jumping in and just having every single opportunity available to you. Yeah, exactly. It's one thing having just a box of Lego, which is huge of fun of just tapping into a warehouse and it's like Legos up to the floor and you just go crazy. Um, you, have to, you have to limit uh, the possibilities that you have. Now, as I said, we haven't been designing actual products in VR that much, but we have uh, presented a lot of sketches. Uh, we do always try to find a way to present sketches in a, in a neat fashion, an orderly fashion. For example, if we have, um, if we have a couple of project, uh, product alternatives, we might just put them together. But if we have a, project, a product and then a product uh, exploded, so you see the internal uh, components, and then another is someone using the product and how it is ergonomically, we put those side to side, but we uh, shield them. We shield them with uh, just some, some plain walls or something to keep things um, understandable and uh, not overwhelm whoever is, is watching the, um, the sketch. So I do try to have some, uh, I guess you could call it housekeeping. Yeah. To keep everything neat and organized. But it, you also are touching on something that's kind of like storytelling. You're almost like, I, I've seen that industrial design sketching where you're adding you know, the arrows and maybe the, the rough character that might be interacting with the object. And I guess that's kind of a similar thing that might be going on in, in this space yeah. here. Yeah. Um, Shane, Shane, we've had a, a question through on the, um, on, on the Q&A from, from Sander. So the question is, are you looking into making the pass-through option from the Oculus Quest a, a background option in Gravity Sketch? Um, yeah. and, the, and the example is for designing things like wearables, furniture, or, or body size products, this feature would be, would be revolutionary. Yeah, yeah. So maybe Lucas, you can you can touch on the AR side, but I'll just quickly yeah. answer the, the technology question. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, absolutely. This is something we want to do, Sander. However, Oculus does limit what type of access we have to the cameras. I, I think this is from a security aspect in terms of you know people using this in very secure places. And as a developer, if we we're able to capture that type of information, it could be it could be a bit challenging but also maybe from the robustness uh, as well. So I'm not sure how robust the, the tracking is yet, or, or maybe that's one of the reasons why they're not exposing it yet. But I know that as developers, we have very limited exposure to accessing the pass-through cameras, but it is something that we're extremely excited about. You know, Vario has the XR1, which we're on the waiting list to, to jump on and try that one out. Mm -hmm. But with the Quest, since it's such a affordable, ubiquitous product, this is something that would, if, if we can access that, that would be amazing. And, and moving into the future, using AR as a part of the review, design, evaluation process, we think is extremely impactful. And just something as simple as your, your iPad or your iPhone and being able to pull up a gravity sketch in that way to view it, and maybe with some limited interactions is something that we're deeply uh, investigating into. But I'd love to hear, Lucas, I'd love to hear your ideas on, on how AR might, might play into the workflow. Yeah, this exact question is, is what I asked in my thesis that I wrote last year. Um, my thesis, the end result was, in a couple of words, you could say gravity sketch in AR um, and how that would affect the design process. And that's huge. 
I think that's huge. And one of the main reasons that I am such a fan of AR in the design process is because I design for the real world. I design for the people that are walking around. I design for the furniture that's standing there. I design for the spaces that the, the products are going to be used in. Um, and virtual reality is empty. In, in essence, it's an empty space. So right now with Gravity Sketch as well, you go forward between a reality and a virtual reality or, or virtual reality. Uh, and those are two separate worlds. Uh, well, I strongly believe that we should be designing uh, products in the space that we, they will be used, and that is the real world. Um, and that's why AR is such, a, such an important, um, important yeah, um, thing for me, because we design for the reality, so it makes sense to design in reality as well. Um, now, I can give you a small tip that I found out, uh, that is when you're in Oculus headset, um, you have that blue wall also surrounding you. Um, and it's for safety. If you go past that blue wall, you could bump into something. But what you could actually do is just put your head outside that wall and then you get the pass-through camera that uh, Oculus has access to, so you can see your room. Um, but there's actually a fade there. There's like a 20 centimeter, 10 inch gap. And you can put your head right in the middle of that gap and then you actually see pass-through plus gravity sketch. And I, you, you can try that, you can make a sketch, just try it, put your head on the border. And that's amazing to me. I was, uh, I was drawing a, um, a case design that would be put on a table and I needed to know where it fit on my table. And it was still a bit difficult in virtual reality to gr grasp the exact scale of what was in front of me. So I went with my head right on that border, saw my camera, saw my kitchen table with all the mess on it, uh, and then placed my sketch on top of that table. And I could grasp, okay, it will just fit. And well, I built a box and it just fits. And that understanding that that, that little slither of AR gave me is just yes, mind boggling to me. So right now we're still, uh, everyone is still limited by the Oculus privacy uh, concerns, which is, it's a very, very valid point. Um, but I give it half a year, a year, someone else will uh, enable the pass through. And I think we're gonna have an, yeah, another explosion of value in my opportunity, in my, um, understanding. Definitely, definitely. I, I want to touch on, I, I would like to encourage more questions here as we wrap up the, the, um, the discussion, but I want to touch on a couple of things here. And one is just on the piggyback on the AR topic. And it's a question that we've asked ourselves a lot here in house. We've, we've obviously have the, the HoloLens and the, and the um, Magic Leap and so forth. And interesting, very interesting devices um, don't quite have the robustness yet of of the quest and, and virtual reality. And I, I think that's for valid reasons in terms of optics and tra tracking and, and so forth. But also we ask ourselves, you know, when is AR actually gonna be the most impactful? And, and, and when is it, um, or when is VR gonna be the most impactful? And, and of course, in the future, probably these two devices will become one. And so we'll probably be having a, a, an AR mode and then a VR mode, like a complete immersion and then obviously showing the real world context. And so from, from my personal perspective, I believe that complete immersion is great for the initial stages of the, of the process. And then as we get towards trying to solve some of the real world constraints and issues and challenges, there could be a, a way for that. Or on the flip side, if you're doing something like interior spaces, you can go ahead and just start kind of sketching out the where things need to change on the interior space in AR initially and then bring it into VR for formalization what, what, what's your take on this kind of AR, VR, the roles that they could play and how we don't have to think of these two separate, but maybe think of these as one continuous workflow? Yeah, exactly. We, we do think of them separately today. Um, I, I, I do strongly believe that the VR type AR, so that's the type uh, of AR that Oculus offers through their camera and display system. So you don't look at the world directly, you see through the eyes of a camera. I think that will uh, become available a lot faster. Uh, even though the, the, the um, HoloLens is already available, but the field of view is just not workable for something like this. So I think that will be the first um, AR that will be accessible. Um, and we'll, I think that the, other, uh, the adoption of that, that type of AR will go quite uh, rapidly, not just because you can see the real world, but also as a social aspect. Uh, when you're together, you can still look at other people. Here in VR, you can look at each other, but you see a, a, a headset of each other. You don't see each other's faces. 
Yeah. Uh, you don't see the space that you're in. You don't see the office. So it's still, the social aspect is still a bit awkward. Um, and any type of AR solves that. So I think the adoption will be very, very fast. I think within two years, if you ask us the same question, we'll just be showing off, okay, but we did this because it yeah. makes so much sense again. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a, there's a transient state space now. Um, We've had a couple of questions in, Shay, if it's all right to, to feel Yeah, I'm just, I'm just reading the question now. So um, in terms of limitations on the, on, from the OBJ files that you can import onto the Quest, you know, it's, we, we try to keep them as, as small as possible, obviously, because your Quest is a, it's a mobile GPU. So you can, I don't know to what software you're bringing them from, but if you use Rhino as a catch-all and just kind of use it as a translation software in a lot of ways, if you're using Rhino or other, or sorry, SolidWorks, other softwares, you can, you can convert to mesh. And then we always use like this, the lowest mesh setting, but like 3000 polys is, is, is probably um, kind of like where you want to kind of sit at the top, top, top side of things. Um, Lucas, how has been your experience bringing in meshes into Quest? Like, what size limitations, polygon count? Well, I've been using Blender a lot, which is a polygon-based uh, modeler. So that's my, my go-to for translating uh, formats. Um, I am used to working with uh, poly count limits. Uh, so when I go from, for example, SolidWorks, if I've made an assembly of, of parts that need to fit together, but I want to have a look at, uh, at them on a one-to-one -one scale, so I import them, I do make sure that I keep the um keep the poly count as low as i can so that means for example no tiny fillets on everything uh, if i have a patent a, a pattern surface finish that sexual geometry i try to suppress that um so you do have to think about it a little bit when you have really large models you, like a whole car interior and everything importing that into gravity sketch it might be a bit difficult um but overall, if you just keep it in mind, I've imported, uh, for example, a bike model. I think it was uh, just under a million. Um, I don't recommend importing one million poly polygons objects, but it works. Uh, just the frame rate drops to a bit of an uncomfortable level. So, yeah. So I think there's there's rendering and then there's um, importing, and so like. Hmm. Well, what I found personally on the Quest is when I import in, in the range of like 3,000 to, to five, 6,000, it's kind of imports pretty on demand. Yeah, but when I, when I Yeah, when I go up higher, it chugs and then it has to like kind of load in. And so you almost just want to take your headset off, let it load and then put your headset back on. Yeah. So it's a bit of a, a chest thing, but I'm really impressed that you've taken um, you've taken so, so many all these into. I have, but I don't recommend it because the frame rate drops and people get nauseated that way. I'm used to it. You, I can handle everything in VR because I'm yeah. so used to it, but I would recommend it. Yeah, one of the, one of the, the people in the, in the chat has mentioned it bringing up to like 200K in the Quest. Um, I, wonder if, I wonder if that's handled pretty, pretty fun. I, I, I personally just haven't brought big files into Quest. I've always brought pretty small files. If you go into the developer, uh, developer page for the Quest, they say if you are developing a game or something, up to 100,000 is, is safe, then you'll be comfortable and just fine. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think the, the, from the loading perspective, it's safe to do, in my opinion, it's safe to do like in the low thousands. But if you want to like take off your headset and load it and then put it back on, maybe, yeah, maybe that, that 100K, 200K mark, probably around there is, is, is probably pretty acceptable. Yeah. Um, and touching on this, what I find really interesting is that you don't necessarily just need to, to create gravity sketch content. You could use this as just an evaluation tool, bringing in all these. It'd be great for you to touch on like design reviews using, using the co-creation feature here, not necessarily only focused on the creation tools. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we haven't done this, um, but I know of some colleagues who do uh, in another design firm. Uh, and one of the main, the main reasons that they do this kind of uh, presentations in VR is because they don't need to make physical prototypes of objects just for the sake of it. For example, if, if we were to create a drill, like the, we're, we're looking at a drill, uh, if we would make some kind of drill, we would have to make some 3D prints of, of the handle and uh, see if it's ergonomic and if the balance is right. Uh, but we won't print 20 different styling variants. It just costs too much to the client, costs too much time as well. Um, but you still want to have a look at those those drills in your hand, really. You want to have a good look at them, not just through a couple of renders. Um, 
so that's where where gravity sketch comes in because you can bring in those CAD models or whatever 3D models it is, um, and you don't have to go through all the the, the labor of uh, okay. physical prototyping. Well, physical prototyping is the only tool that allows you to actually feel the weight of a thing. You can't yeah. do it in VR. Um, it's, this is still a, a yeah um, a lot faster way of prototyping. Yeah, so maybe it's like making quick, understandable prototypes and then only focusing in on like a, maybe a select few that you ever go to 3D printing and, and so forth. And Oftentimes, yeah. Just wanted to give you a chance to chat a little bit about this kind of box VR that you, or box sketch, <laughs> sketch in a box that you guys are working on. Sorry if I slipped the name. Sketchbox. Yeah, yeah, Sketchbox. But I think this is a really interesting concept that you guys have because we're talking about review, we're talking about meeting with clients. And Absolutely. you mind sharing this concept that you guys are working on? Absolutely. Um, so Sketchbox is something that we have uh, not launched yet. So I have to be a little bit secretive about it. I can't share pictures yet. Um, but what it essentially is, is a toolbox. It's a toolbox that contains all the hardware and all the technology that you need to get set up in VR uh, and to use co-creation as well. So it contains uh, four AR, uh, VR headsets, Oculus Quest, I just love the platform. Uh, it contains internet access, it contains uh, charging installation, it contains all the accessories that you need. Um, and we've mainly created it to get away from the hassle of setting up uh, and of managing VR headsets. Because like we said earlier, we're still talking a lot about the hardware, while that in five years the hardware won't be an issue anymore, that's what I believe. So we should be thinking about the value. And this box is made to um, to reduce that struggle to get into the hardware as much as possible and offer a product that we can offer our clients or our designers internally um, as a solution. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a physical box uh, that we can use internally or we could bring it to uh, a client or to a conference or anywhere and just have people joining us in co-creation for headsets, um, have that communication without having the sensors and the PCs and the cables, everything's wireless. So, uh, we will be launching this probably in September uh, and we'll be yeah, putting that open to our own designers to get learning into Gravity Sketch using co-creation, which is very interesting, by the way, when we talk about co-creation, learning Gravity Sketch is really great if you have someone you can tag along with, someone who knows the tool, and you can just join, join them in co-creation and he can show you how things work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a beautiful way of learning, learning the tool. So we can do that or clients or, or uh, yeah, conferences. So, so we'll be launching that. If you want to follow that, you can just go uh, follow our page, achilles.be, our main uh, website page. And yeah, you can see what we're up to there. Cool. So we, we're just wrapping up the end of the session here. And um, there's a couple qu questions I just want to answer really quickly. Um, one's from Ryan. It's a bit of a question around the, the workflow into CAD and from OBJ or vice versa. And then being able to kind of link things together so that you have almost this like kind of real-time update. So what we can say at the moment is we're building a really robust Rhino integration and we hope to do the same thing for SolidWorks and a few others where you can just drag and drop a Gravity Sketch file over and it would just update the data using the, the engine of Rhino or using the engine of, of SolidWorks to build it out. So you can then work from, you know, SolidWorks would be a 3D sketch and then the 3D sketch will either have like an extrusion applied to it or revolve or something like this. And then in Rhino, we actually just have a layer system with the actual geo in there. But going to back and forth is something that we're, we're really interested in. And I think we just need a bit more information about how people want to go back and forth. So one thing that we've talked a lot about in-house is that we can bring an IGES file, but we have to test late that. And so we wouldn't expect that the user would want to edit too much of that IGES file in VR, but maybe just use that as a reference. And so when you bring it back over, it just replaces it. You just replace it or don't export that aspect and just export the amendments or the sketches that you've made on the, on the side in the peripheral. But this is something that is a, a probably a deeper, deeper discussion for maybe um, uh, another webinar where we can talk a little bit about that. I think that. if I could just add to that, um, if you're curious of how that would look, I think that Datasmith is a really good example of how that could work. Uh, that's an unreal feature. Uh, it's, it's a piece of software that communicates to so many other pieces of, of other software, both mesh-based mesh as NURBS-based. Um, so I think that type of integration would, would yeah, would be Absolutely. a solution. 
you know, we've been looking at that quite, quite, um, quite strictly. So it's a, it's a, it's a great piece of tech. And then another one was around the, the VR controllers and whether or not being sufficient. This is from Will. And do we see like additional options coming in the future so to help, I guess, work more effectively in 3D design? So he's, he's a huge shortcut worker, right? So he's using this keyboard and, and doing the shortcuts to either keyboard and mouse or keyboard and walk on tablet. And so, you know, the, the controller, let's be honest, right now is just an Xbox controller split into two, right? So yep. it, it, it literally is a gaming controller. It does, maybe doesn't take into account all your, your fingers, right? And in some ways it's nice because it gives us a bit of restriction to what we can actually develop and build and makes things, we, makes us challenge ourselves to think, think, think more simplistic, but also think in a, in a more direct way. Like how can we get to this point without doing three or four button combinations? And then on another side, you know, there, there's this archetype, which is not familiar to um, a seat more seasoned designer and, and can we bring something like this into into VR and does this make sense especially for a designer who uses your client like everyone knows how to pick up a pen but then there's no haptic feedback right so how do you know you're creating and sketching in a very confident way it's more of like this um, this one like you're an orchestra so so there's I think that, like, there, we'll see a wave of, of peripherals and one thing I always say about this industry is that the quest is kind of like the, the Nokia brick right we all had one and now we all have our iPhone or our smartphones, and there's a, a whole lot of peripherals if we think about our laptops. Now we have, you know, Logitech has so many different types of mice. You can get so many different types of keyboards, and so I think we're just at, we're just cresting this idea where it becomes okay. This is actually your main hardware. You probably won't even get controllers in the box. You probably have to go and buy your controllers somewhere else. You'll probably buy different straps and different things that you could bring into your environment. And maybe you're using a controller sometimes and maybe you're using a wand sometimes. Could I, so could I add to that? that? I'd love to add to that. Uh, and to continue your, your phone analogy, um, I think in the beginning when we had that brick, we had a screen, which is for display, and you had the buttons, which were for interaction. Uh, and then iPhone came along and they said, yeah, just have your finger and put that on the screen. Um, and that made a lot of sense. Uh, but it became possible because of touch screens and, and bigger displays. And I think in VR, the controller to me makes sense. It's like the buttons and the display to me, it makes sense. Uh, but when we go to AR, for example, when you can start drawing in the real world, you might want to draw on top of something. You want to draw directly on, for example, uh, if you're a fashion designer, you want to draw on top of a mannequin or you want to draw on top of a table and, and have an extrusion that is flat on that table. So one, one of the times when, when we might go towards like a pen stylus type, uh, of, of controller might be when we step into, v, into AR and start combining the real world into the, v, into the virtual one. So in my thesis, that was one of the things. It was a, an actual stylus with a pressure sensitive tip to combine that real world haptic feedback with uh, AR, VR sketches. Definitely. And, and those of you who, I know we're wrapping up, so we'll just kind of wrap up on a couple of things here and sure. I'll let you have a, um, the last yeah. word, um, Lucas. But those of you who are really kind of enthusiastic enthusiasts in the space and have uh, the, the, the Vive or any others. Look at the Log Logitech VR pen. It's an interesting proposition. And, you know, one question I always ask when, when people are looking for the perfect uh, device, there's no perfect mouse, a lot of different mice and you have your preference, but I would more move towards pen and paper. And you, you, you typically have like a few pens, you have some markers, you have a ruler. So you have like, you have, tools for your sketching space and that's one thing that we're really really passionate about and sometimes you have your hands right so we have hand tracking coming right so this is an area that you just keep an eye on we're definitely deeply researching the space we're open for collaborations with with universities who are also doing this type of research but we'd love to find like where this direction is going and how do we make it as physical as possible when i'm in a workshop i don't use my hammer for everything right i use my hammer for a few things and i have my screwdriver my drill gun I have a plane, I have all these different tools that help me craft that piece of wood. And I think we'll have that same type of experience where we can bring that digital craft aspect um, together in, in a tool like ours. And that's that's what we're really championing. But just to wrap up the this chat, Lucas, I'd love for you to have the, the last word on you know, collaboration features, working in VR, how you can bring this to clients and your design team and um, love for you to just kind of carry us out. Sure. Um... For, for me, I've been having a great time. At Achilles, I've been given the chance to work on what I'm interested in and be able to deploy graphic sketch inside the team. And 
showing the tools and virtual reality, but also gravity sketch to my colleagues, but also my family, my friends. Uh, I have a friend who's an, an artist who's never, who doesn't really work on the, on the PC. Uh, I've shown gravity sketch to so many people and each of them was amazed and each of them said, this makes so much sense. And that's the main uh, idea, the main feeling that I have about gravity sketch is this makes so much sense. Once you've used this, you just understand why this tool is so, so powerful. Uh, you wouldn't want to want to go without it. So for me, it's like uh, this, this gem that is really powerful, but that not too many people have discovered yet. But I want to share this gem definitely with my colleagues and the rest of the world. Um, and yeah, if you want to discover it, just come to Achilles and I'll be glad to, to talk about the tool and what it can do for your design idea or your project as our clients. Um, I've been having an amazing time. It's not, for me, it's not about the hardware. It's not about the technical stuff. It's just about the value that it gives to me as a designer, the create, the create, the creativity that I'm given, um, and the, the sheer value that we give to our clients by being able to be fast and productive and creative. Yeah. So very well said. Makes sense. It just <laughs> very makes well sense. Said. Thanks so much, Lucas. Um, I really appreciate your time and spending time, even though we've gone over a bit. On the uh, last few things uh, for those of you that are still watching, we're we're holding um, free trials of Gravity Sketch collaboration. So just what you see on the screen, you guys can sign up now, um, and the link will be shared when this video is published. But also, we can share it in the chat now. You can sign up through the Gravity Sketch website, also through the Landing Pad website, and we'd love to to hear your use case and, and get you guys set up and, and starting to explore this, especially if you already set up with VR. Uh, yeah, appreciate your time and spending, spending uh, a really good session chatting about VR and creativity and design, Lucas. Absolutely, it's been a joy. Yeah, cheers, thanks. <laughs>